All right, church. Well, good to see all of you. Uh, if you have your Bibles, that's our main text uh, that we'll be kind of going out of today is uh, Matthew 16. And uh, today is a unique service uh, in that we have a what we now call a gratitude service. So it used to be uh, that we would have members meetings and uh, talk about here's how the previous year went and there's a lot of numbers and so we decided let's make it a little bit different, uh, a little bit less, um, for lack of a better word, boring. And uh, let's see if we can figure out a way to encourage the church. Here's what God has done and here's uh, where we're going. And so it's a little bit different service. We're taking a break from our sermon series. As uh, Michael said in the intro, Good Friday is coming up. Easter Sunday is coming up. And so in Good Friday, we're gonna have communion and we're gonna remember uh, the death of the Lord Jesus. And on Easter, we're gonna celebrate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Um, but for today, here's kind of how it looks. 10 to 15 minutes. Let me be more realistic. 15 to 20 minutes. And I promise this isn't like my special 15, 20 minutes where it takes about 40. This is an actual 15, 20 minutes of seeing the word of God, laying a foundation of here's where God has brought us. And then we're going to uh, watch a video and then we're going to uh, pray for those who serve. So that's the outline of the service. But let's get started uh, in Matthew chapter 16 from what we just read. The context of Matthew 16 is Jesus is coming to his disciples and he's asking, um, who do the people say that I am? Like you go around and what are people saying about me? And the answer, well, some say you're Elijah and some say you're one of the prophets and some say um, that, that, that you're a prophet. And so then Jesus turns it on them and asks them, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter, being the bold one of the disciples, gets up and says, you are Jesus, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, blessed are you, Peter, because not you didn't come to that from your own conclusions. My father has revealed that to you. And on this rock, on the foundation of Jesus is the Christ, he is the son of the living God, is built the whole church throughout all history, all people, all nations everywhere. The most important question that you will have to answer is, who is Jesus? The question that he asks his disciples, who do the people say that I am? In your life, this is the most important question that every person will have to answer. Who is Jesus? And you look at today and you see people say, well, he was a good teacher. Or, well, he is a prophet. Or, he was a, a historical figure. Or, to some people, he's a fantasy. Or, he's made up. Or, he's just something that cuckoo Christians believe in. And for the Christian... The Christian is the one who says Jesus is Christ, the Messiah. Jesus is God. And there's no other way to salvation. There's no other way into the church but through that statement. Jesus, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And blessed are you that my father has revealed it to you. And blessed are we when we believe. And that's the distinguishing between all people is who is Christ. And what does he say next? On this foundation I will build my church, on this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. There is this thinking that when we're talking about the gates of hell in this context, that we're talking about the gates to the church. And so here's the church and she's saved and she's righteous and the world will not be able to prevail against the church. And so all the attacks, all the sexual immorality, all the sin won't be able to prevail against the church. And so the church is kind of in, it's got the gates and nothing will be able to overcome the church. But it doesn't say the gates of the church, does it? It says the gates of hell will not be able to prevail against it. And gates are not meant as a use of attack. Gates are meant as use for defense, to be able to guard and to be able to keep in. 
And so here's what Jesus is saying, that as the church goes, as the church proclaims Jesus, as the church preaches the gospel and says that Jesus is God, the gates of hell will not be able to hold. And so when the church shines in the darkness, the darkness won't be able to overcome it. That the light of the church, the salt of the earth, which is what the church is, that darkness will not be able to overcome that. And for 2,000 years, we have seen darkness try to persecute the church, try to uh, belittle the church, try to kill the church. And they were much more powerful than the church. You have the Roman Empire, the greatest empire to have ever been, America's not even close to what the Roman Empire was in their day, controlling basically the whole known world. The greatest empire in the world tried to defeat the church, and they were not able. Why? Because Jesus said, I will build my church. Not the church will build the church, not the disciples will build the church. I will build my church. It is God, we are fully dependent on him. And there is an assurance when we believe that God is the one and we know that God is the one building the church, there is an assurance and a guarantee and a blessing that comes from that, that you will not be able to be defeated. In 1 Samuel, we read this story between uh, Israel and the Philistines and they're uh, waging war against one another and you have Israel's camp and you have the Philistine camp camp and they fight and Israel is defeated and sent back trying to figure out, okay, what's our next point of attack? What are we going to do next? And then they come up with this idea. We're going to take the Ark of the Covenant and we're going to bring it with us uh, into battle and the Lord will be the one who will fight uh, for us and Philistines will not be able to overcome. And so they bring in the Ark of the Covenant. Israel is rejoicing and shouting so much so that the Bible says the Philistines heard it and then they figured out, oh, they brought the Ark of the Covenant in and they were kind of uh, terrified that now the Ark of the Covenant is there. And what happens next is uh, Israel goes into battle with the Philistines. Philistines are like, let's attack him. And in that, Israel is once again defeated and the Ark of the Covenant now taken by the Philistines. And, you know, it was kind of this manipulation on the part of Israel to try to bring the Ark of the Covenant in uh, to battle. You know, for some of us, um, maybe you don't do this. Um, I remember kind of doing this. You'd begin to take your Bible into difficult places. And just because your Bible is there, well, of course God's going to have to bless me in the difficult places, right? I mean, it's the word of God with me. You've actually got to open it up and read and obey, but that's a whole nother thing. But it's this kind of superstitious religion, right? We're going to just take it, and then, of course, God's going to owe us, and God's going to have to bless us, and he's going to have to give us victory. But they lose, and then they come back. And what they realize is that the issue wasn't necessarily the Ark of the Covenant. The issue was their own sin, and in 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 5, here's what we read and how they responded. Then Samuel said, gather all Israel at Mitzvah, and I will pray to the Lord for you. So they gathered at Mitzvah and drew water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted on that day and said there, we have sinned against the Lord. By the way, fasting is not just when you ask God for something. Sometimes fasting is for repentance, but that's a separate topic. And Samuel judged the people of Israel at Mizpah. And now when the Philistines heard that the people of Israel had gathered at Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the people of Israel heard of it, they were afraid of the Philistines. And the people of Israel said to Samuel, do not cease to cry out for the Lord our, to the Lord our God for us, that he may save us from the hand of the Philistines. So Samuel took a nursing lamb and offered it um, as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. And Samuel cried out to the Lord for Israel, and the Lord answered him. As Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to attack Israel. But the Lord thundered with a mighty sound that day against the Philistines and threw them into confusion, and they were defeated before Israel. They weren't defeated necessarily by Israel, but even before they get there, and the Philistines... 
uh, and, and, and the men of Israel went out from Mitzvah and pursued the Philistines and struck them as far as below uh, Bethkar. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mitzvah and Shem and called its name Ebenezer, for he said, till now the Lord has helped us. And so Israel overcomes this battle and Samuel's there after offering the burnt sacrifices, after praying for Israel. Israel has a repentant heart. He sets a stone and says, till now the Lord has helped us. Meaning what? Meaning, hey Israel, you didn't do this by your own craftiness. You didn't do this by your own strength. You didn't do this by your own power. You sinned against the Lord and then you repented. And what is always true about God is that those who sin against him and repent he will call back and he will restore and he will save and he will give victory. And so he sets the stone and says, till now the Lord has helped us. And it's the same thing that we can say about the church. You look at the 2,000 year history of the church, I say it all the time, you're here because some ordinary men and women took the call of the gospel seriously, they preached it to you, and now you are here And so if you're looking to bash the old generation or you're looking to bash the old traditions or the old style, I'm telling you this is not the place for you to bash. We owe them everything being here. For 2,000 years, the blood of faithful men, faithful women, who we will see in heaven and rejoice with them, it's on their backs that we are here. To this place, the Lord has helped us. Men would not be crafty enough to overcome these empires. Men would not be crafty enough to overcome persecution. Till now, Jesus said, I will build my church. Till now, the Lord has helped us. And two things that we see in the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 18. You know, every time we read the Great Commission, for whatever reason, we start with verse 19. That's a, that's a problem. We've got to start in verse 18. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, and Jesus said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And so you have two statements that are interlinked here. Verse 18, all authority, Jesus said, all authority, the word there, by the way, in the Greek means all, all authority on heaven, in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That's it. Everything else that Jesus says after this statement will absolutely come to pass. Why? Because verse 18, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. It's not some of the authority. It's not like Jesus is fighting with Satan. Who's going to have power? Who's going to win? Darkness or light, good or evil? That's not the story. Jesus has already won. Jesus has already risen from the dead. And all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him. We are fully dependent on Christ. Just like Israel in 1 Samuel was fully dependent on God. We are fully dependent on God. And it's not a battle, but Jesus is going, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. There's a humility that must come for the church. When we understand he is king of kings, Lord of lords. And what's the second thing? He says, all authority has been given to me. And what does he say? Go, therefore. Go, therefore. Now, isn't it interesting that Jesus could have said, all authority on heaven and earth is given to me out, and I'm going to save people. But what does he say? All authority is mine, and you go therefore and make disciples of all nations. That yes, there is the sovereignty of God. Yes, there is the authority of Christ. But he says to the church, you go therefore. And you make disciples of all nations. And it's what the church has done, and it's what we continue to do today. And he says, go and make disciples. Disciples, we got to stop thinking that disciples are converts. They're not. Discipleship takes a full lifetime, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. 
That's why when we do missions, we don't do missions, and we don't just go to a place and preach the gospel, and by God's grace, maybe somebody is saved, and then we just leave. Our way of doing missions is we want to partner with local churches so that when people are saved, they are connected to the church. Why? Because they're going to need that to be disciples of Jesus Christ. It's the whole reason here of how we do local missions. It's not just so people hear the gospel and are saved, but it's so they hear the gospel, are saved, Jesus, plug into the church, and let's begin to be disciples. There is a reason of why we structure things this way. It's because God has called us to make disciples, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and look at what he says, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now, a lot of us in this room, um, kind of looking around the room, we've got different age brackets, but here's what I can confidently say. Uh, no matter how young you are, this side of the room, and then, right, anyway, no matter how, long, how young you are, here's the thing. You're, you're not, you're not, um, not going to be on earth till the end of the age, probably. Right? Like, I don't, I don't think you're going to live that long no matter how young you are. And Jesus will return, but what does he say? I am with you always to the end of the age. And he's telling this to his immediate disciples. He's telling this to his immediate disciples, who we know they've died, and what, what has happened? Has the Lord left them? Are they not with Christ? No, they're still with Christ. And so whether we are here on earth or whether we are uh, passed away and in heaven, we are still with the Lord because his promise, again, I am, all authority is given to me, verse 20, and I am with you always till the end of the age. What can separate you from the love of Christ and uh, from the love of God in Christ Jesus? Nothing. What can separate you from Christ? Nothing. Because all authority and I'm with you but you have this gap, you have this life, you have this moment in between where we as the church who are saved and we are with Christ, we still have some work to do before we get to heaven. We still have some work to do. And so here's the invitation. Go therefore and make disciples. Um, there will come a day when we pass away and we stand before the Lord. And my question is, with the little time that you have here, maybe it's a couple of decades, maybe it's five decades, maybe for some of us it's seven or eight or nine decades. But with that many de those decades that you have, with that life that you have, what are you living for and what are you leaving behind? Because like I said, we are here because of faithful men and women who came before us. We are here because of their faithfulness, and now it's our turn. It's our turn to be faithful. It's our turn to proclaim the gospel. It's our turn to raise godly children. It's our turn to leave a legacy. And the invitation of this church, as we talk about gratitude service and where we were and where we're going, the invitation of this church is twofold. We will become a type of people, and we will do things for the sake of the name of the Lord. And so all of us as members, we have signed up to, number one, become a type of people, become the people of God, become more and more like Jesus, to be sanctified. That's first and foremost what God is concerned, you being a person after his heart, following him as a disciple. But the second it flows out of that. You will do the things to bring glory to his name. You will build and raise up children for his name. And you will build and raise up businesses for his name. And you will build and raise up people for his name. And you will leave a legacy for his name. That's the invitation of the church. And it's much grander than some of these silly little dreams that we have in the world. Because all those things are fleeting, all those things will pass away. But in this church, we become the people of God, and then we live for his name, his glory alone. Amen? Amen.